it's not suggesting it. Hello. Yeah, this is better. Yeah. Let me come on. Okay, I think it's just ten after. Just a second, I need to turn and shoot. So you put it this way, yeah. so I can read the name. Thank you. Are you coming, Lawrence? I'm closing a little bit. <coughs> we could just leave it like that. Yeah, good. Um, okay, um, we're on needs. We, I think we. Uh, finish about half, so I'm going to finish meats today, and I'm hoping to finish poultry and fish, which are two short topics. And uh, so there was a question earlier, um, what to do with the lab reports, because because of the holiday week coming up, Thanksgiving, which is next week. So I um, so let me give it a. Uh, thought. I'm going to talk to Emil also. I'd like to propose that maybe I give you an extension of your lab report because some of you um, won't do your lab until tomorrow and Thursday, so that means it's running into your uh, the Thanksgiving week. So I'm going to talk to Emil. I'd like to propose that I will give you an extension of time for your lab report, okay? But for your online quiz, uh, I'm doing the lecture today, for those who are not here, you're supposed to be, they're supposed to view it shortly afterwards. Uh, so I still like to follow the same schedule, maybe uh, give you until, instead of Saturday night, until Sunday night, because if you're gone, then you'll be gone for the week anyway. How's that? I'll give you an extension one day, how would that work? Because I've got uh, one online quiz on meats and another one on poultry and fish. So. So those are the two, It'll give you an extra day. And if you are out of town, it's best probably to get it out of the way. If you, if you think that you need an, an extension for some reason, please let me know. So otherwise, I'm gonna talk to Emil about lab reports being delayed for some time. Otherwise, everything we should follow the course uh, syllabus the way it is, okay? Um, okay, so last time on meets, we are, let me see. I think we went to inspection. Let me take a look. Uh, or grade. Uh, let me see. I think inspection of meats. I think we talked about that. I could do it the other way. I'm doing the hard way, the long way. <sighs> let 
Okay, I'm almost there. Ah, now I've gone over. All right. Yeah, I think this is where we, we left out, right? The inspection you need. It's important for you to know anytime you see a round stamp, it's, it's a stamp for wholesomeness. That means the meat was safe to eat. In the United States, it's very important. All meats are inspected in terms of uh, safety. So this is wholesomeness to ensure that the meat is safe to eat and it's wholesome. It's a federal law that requires the inspection of all animal carcasses before we take it to the store, the, the butcher to be cut up and before the consumers eat them. And how do you know it? It's by the shape of the stamp. The stamp has to be round. So sometimes you see that round inspection stamp. Okay? I think we were on this one. We also talked about this. Okay. Um, on, uh, let me see. On grading. The difference between inspection stamp and grading stamp, the first of all, the shape of the stamp is different. It has a shield shape. This is, this is a shield shape, shield, not round. Okay. The difference between this and inspection stamp is that this is voluntary. Often, if it says USDA, that means they need the help of USDA still to grade it, basically grading it to be prime, choice, or select. Yeah, this is where we left it at. Before, we used to have something like eight different grades, and it was so confusing. So finally, they reduced it to only three. So of the three, basically, prime is, of course, the best, has the most marbling, the best tasting, the, the um, most tender piece of meat, USDA choice will be also good, okay, but USDA select will be ordinary. So often, because if it's ordinary, you very seldom would see select shields, select grade. Why should they put it on? So you would only see, generally speaking, either choice or prime. Prime would only, generally speaking, sold to very expensive restaurants where they want the tenderness and also not just tenderness, texture, the color, everything, a fat distribution, enough marbling, and of course the flavor. So when the restaurant advertised prime grade meat, you know you're getting the best. So that's grading. It's voluntary. They don't have to have the meat graded. Um, the meat packer grades it because they know that they could demand higher price for prime grades. So they do that. So they get more money back. Okay, so choice is also very good. So basically it's based on these factors, the color, the grain, surface texture, fat dis distribution. A lot of it depends on marbling also. Unfortunately, it's the amount of fat too. But again, we talked about prime. If it has more marbling, that means it has uh, more fat. Also, it has more flavor and tenderness that the consumer, generally speaking, would like to have. Okay. So if you want to know more details, the, this I already mentioned, very tender, juicy, and flavorful. And this is quite tender, quite juicy, good flavor. This is only fairly tender, not as juicy, not as flavorful. So these are the two common ones that you might see, the shield shape. So I'm sure I'm going to ask you, if you see a shield shape grade, what does it mean? Voluntary. It's better cut of meat, but if it's inspection shape, it has to be round. It's mandatory. Any meat that you eat in the United States has to meet the inspection stamp, and they have it. Generally speaking, you may not see it, but it's just that in, in the slaughterhouse, that's where once USDA staff has examined the meat and the carcass, it's healthy, it's safe to eat, and then they, they're the ones who will put all those stamps. It's actually it's all the way, they run the stamp all the way from the top of the carcass all the way down so that every kind of meat that you get, you will see this purple 
round stamp. Okay? So though that's the main distinction between these two uh, stamps, which you should know. And this is pretty much what we already talked about before. <laughs> Americans eat too much meat. <laughs> so it's you're up to 220 pounds per person per year. And uh, the problem is that they just uh, overdose these animals with antibiotics and uh, growth hormone, which we don't particularly care for. So sometimes <coughs> when you give them too much antibiotic and hormones and all, all those chemical residues reside inside the meat. And when we eat it, we get some of this too, especially growth hormone. We don't want children to be growing as fast uh, as they really should be. And the news is that uh, American girls who eat too much meat, okay, as young as seven are entering puberty, ba basically at double the rate every year they think that this can be really bad, and especially when they gain more weight also. So we're concerned. So that's what we are concerned with, but they keep doing it uh, for profit and all that, so I hope maybe one day they're gonna be controlling that also. To, it's not necessary, it's okay. The meat is sometimes and often tastier if they're not so fatty anyway. I like lean meat, there's nothing wrong with it, it's healthier and all that. And, and also the organic, meats. So if we want organic meats, we want meats from animals who roam around, okay, are fed with grass rather than uh, um, corn or what, whatever feed that they give them that's too fattening. But uh, organic meats are, again, too expensive. It's only, you know, 3%, maybe 5% up to now, but still not enough for us to be able to afford organic meats all the time because they do cost a lot. Unfortunately, these are the controversies that we have we faced with. Oh, did I miss something at the end? Oh, grass-fed beef is uh, lower in fat, of course, I talked about that. And when it's lower in fat, of course, it's better for health. We talked about that in the class of nutrition, uh, prevent cancer and prevent heart diseases, which is something that we're always concerned with, that we're picking up way, way too fast without worrying about it, which we probably should. So let's talk about the tenderness of beef. Of course, everybody likes meat that's tender. And how do we get tender meats? And last time we talked about it, it often depends on the cut, where it's coming from, from the carcass. We'll be talking about that a lot more, a little bit later. And also the age. When it's too old, of course, animals too old, then of course the meat is gonna be tough. Uh, Fat content, we already talked about that. If it has more fat, more marbling, it'll be more tender. Uh, <clears throat> but sometimes meats could be treated also, okay, with tenderizer. We talk about that in Asian countries. That's what they do to tenderize meat. And sometimes it could be just as good. Yeah. Can you Hi. say if it's older, it's tougher? Uh, older is tougher, correct. Yeah. Um, you Susanna, right? I don't have the sheep. Yeah, she no names. Where's the sheep? Uh, oh, yeah, good. It's helpful. Thank you. Ah, did you? Okay, here. There. Oh, Savannah. Sorry. Almost got it. <laughs> um, let's see where we are. Um, so sometimes we could put tenderizer, we'll talk about it in just a little while, and also the cooking method. If we introduce, now what they have done is that meats that are not that tender, you know, the cooking method has a lot to do with it. If you have slow cooking, sometimes they cook meat overnight, very low temperature, overnight, can actually tenderize the collagen too. So these are the three methods of, of course, that could give you more tender cuts of meat, tender meat. I'm speeding up a little bit because I want to cover all three topics that I possibly can today. Okay, and there will be two online quizzes, one on meat, which is a long class, the other one on poultry and fish, which are short classes. Okay, let me see whether I could get it done or not. 
did. There are two types of, some of the slides I would just won't even cover, or just briefly just uh, skip because you don't need to know, but I'll mention a little bit. There, there is a wholesale cuts and retail cuts. Wholesale cuts are larger cuts okay, that they sell, uh, that they sell to the butchers. Okay. And from wholesale cuts, the butchers will cut them up into retail cuts and they sell, sell them at the grocery store. Okay, so we'll be talking about these cuts because it's important for you to know the meat cuts, which is very important. And I'm going to skip around, won't be covering veal, which is, and pork and all that. It's just everyone, if you know meat well, everything was pretty much the same. The other carcasses are pretty much the same. So generally speaking, okay, generally speaking, there are seven wholesale or primal cuts. These are the large cuts that they sell. These are the, the carcass cuts up into these large cuts, okay, before they reach the supermarket. You, you don't see them at the supermarket. And retail cuts are the individual, the, the retail cuts, the w smaller cuts that we buy from the grocery store, okay? Now, we remember last time we talked about this before? When you take a look at the carcass, the animal, rather, okay, if we were to cut the, uh, uh, the carcass up into seven, seven large cuts, okay, which part of the animal will give you the most tender cuts of meat that are most expensive? Which part? I'm talking about shoulder, the back, leg, neck, anywhere. A shoulder will move around because they have to eat grass. Okay. Uh, st stomach, still they move, stomach, but still, you're right, the, still more tender. The back, the back, they basically don't move very much. Okay, so that's where you get the best cuts, the most expensive cuts. So if you take a look at these seven cuts, which cuts would be, which cut would be almost smack in the middle? Short loin, you must remember that. Short loin is where it gives you the filet mignon, T-bone steak, uh, uh, the, the New York steak and all that. We'll go into more detail a little bit later, okay? And which two, and then after that, which other cut would be almost as tender but not as tender and a little less expensive? Uh, I beg your pardon? Sirloin, also very good, but the, the rib probably would be better. Sirloin also, yeah, they use more, because of the bones, use more uh, for steak, but for also uh, for roast beef. The best is right here, the rib roast, the most expensive. And it, you have to use dry. Remember we said that any cut that's tender, that has marbling, and the meat is tender, you never want to cook it the moist heat method. Always dry heat. Dry heat would be roasting it, do what? Broiling it, like for steak, grilling it, okay? Unless if you want to fry it, but of course none of these will be fried. They're too expensive for frying. So rib gives you the standing rib roast, which is the most expensive. Also dry heat, you have to roast it. You don't add liquid to it, just dry roast the most expensive cut, the standing rib roast right there, okay? So the third, almost actually just as good in location is what? I think Savannah, you just mentioned. Okay, the sirloin. Sirloin gives you steaks. The steaks are not as tender as a short loin, like tenderloin steak or um, New York steak. But sirloin, pretty good. You could still eat it as regular steak dry cooked method, okay? So how about the parts that are tough? Those are the three areas that gives you the best cuts. How about chuck? Chuck is the shoulder area because it has, the animal has to, has to eat the grass, eat the feed, whatever it is, so it moves still the leg or move around and look around. So chuck, generally speaking, has to have moist seed cooking. 
moist heat. It's cooked for a long time, braising it. Okay, pot roast. Actually, very good using sort of using check roast, uh, or just ground beef. Ground beef. And if you take a look at the back, which is the round, actually that piece also is pretty good. It doesn't move around very much. That part of the muscle. So it's generally speaking used as just roast beef that you find at any buffet table. You, you see a big piece of roast beef sometimes? They have to slice it very thinly because it would be tough if it's too thick, if it's like cut into a steak. So they slice it very thinly, cut against the grain. It's perfectly good, very thin slices at the cafeteria. For example, would you like some roast beef? You've got a great big beef piece of a roast beef sitting on the <coughs> um, cutting board. So that from, that's round. Sometimes round could give you also steaks, round steaks and all that. And sometimes you could grill, you could uh, broil. It's okay to use dry heat, but sometimes you have to use moist heat to allow it to cook longer to tenderize the collagen. So this is, so the chuck definitely a depth moist heat. Round, either moist heat or dry heat, but it would not it will be somewhat tough, okay? So the most tender piece you must, we talk about wholesale cut, is what? Short loin, okay? We'll go into more detail. Sirloin, also very tender, not nearly as tender as short loin, and rib, also very tender, but it's, it looks beautiful for Christmas or for New Year's. You have a, the standing rib roast standing there, and you slice, you slice it into very thick, and it's still very tender. Now let's take a look at the bottom of the carcass. Okay. The leg part, sh the shank, the shank, four shank, definitely. You use it for soup or stew, moisty cooking. You have to cook it for a long time, slow, moisty cooking to tenderize the meat because a lot of collagen there, okay? And then over there, you probably can't see the brisket. The brisket, typically beef, um, um, what, what kind of beef? Corned beef, boiled beef, you have to cook it in water, so it's moisty. Cook it for a long time. Typically, corned beef, cook it for a long time. Because moisty, that means you have to use water to, to tenderize the collagen. Okay, short plate and flank, because it's in the, some, somebody said that in the belly, it's still tender sometimes. Yeah, but not nearly as tender as those. Still sometimes tender. A fl flank is something that could, you, you know, Asians use flank a lot for, for, for stir fry. No moisture, stir fry. It's still very tender. Okay. Sometimes, if not, flank uses sometimes. It's they're somewhat fatty in the middle because they don't move around, so it's still fatty. You know. But sometimes you could use it as they, they use it as ground meat. Uh, short plate. This is great for braised short ribs. They sell very expensive, but it's with moist heat. Moisty, that means you have to introduce broth or introduce uh, water to it. Braise the beef, short ribs. You know, you cook it for three hours and the collagen just turns into gelatinous gravy. Just wonderful. Right here, you could demand it's still high price because it's still somewhat tender and yet you, you need moisty. Okay? So, uh, let me see, what else? Oh, at the bottom of the round. Round, the top part is top round. It's great for roast beef. If you slice it thinly, it's still good for roast beef. No moisture. But the lower half is too tough sometimes. So lower half, you do have to sometimes often use it. Uh, sometimes they just grind it. Sometimes uh, you could use moist heat. The, the bottom round, okay. Um, they use uh, moist heat. Moisty, that means you introduce, you put some tomato sauce, you put some juice to it, and it's still very tenderized after it's cooked, but uh, it takes a little while for cooking. Now, with the general introduction of these cuts, because, it's, because it is difficult to know, I now reemphasize to tell you but, uh, more in detail about these cuts. We talked about this, let's talk about the most expensive and tender cuts, primal cuts, cut, 
or wholesale cut is which part? I asked you the third time already. What is the name of it? Right in the middle, right here, short loin. Okay, in that particular cut, and let me stretch this here. A typical cut right in the middle is a T-bone steak or porterhouse. The porterhouse is the most expensive. If you trim it a little bit, of course, we get, this is where the, the meat is nicely marbled. And this is, okay. This is a piece of muscle that goes on top right here. Did you see that? Runs all the way. Okay. Very expensive piece of meat. It's called New York steak or loin steak. They call it different names sometimes. Okay. And this is the part that's, that's most tender. Porterhouse or T-bone steak, top loin. Sometimes they call it, they fancy name, New York loin steak. Okay. Very expensive. But this piece, smaller piece, is the most, absolutely the most expensive cut of meat. Small, but it's long. What is it? Can you guess? Filet mignon. Thank you. Filet mignon, if you pull this this piece of meat, this piece of, it, you see, it starts, it starts here. Right? By the time it goes to sirloin, it's already tough. But it's right here, underneath here. You see it at number two and number three is the filet mignon. You could practically, it, it, it practically melts in your mouth, people say, when it's so nice and tender. Um, so let's take a look at the steak. You see the porterhouse has two pieces of muscle, the T-bone. You still see a little bit of filet, filet mignon underneath. That's the tenderloin, okay, or filet mignon. At the top is the, the, uh, uh, is the loin, top loin piece of muscle. So th they often will remove this piece and cut it into steak. They call it loin steak or New York steak or whatever. They remove this, they could cut it into call it filet mignon, only in this section, because it's the most tender section, okay? Tenderloin, filet mignon right here, okay? That piece. I don't want to give you um, physiological names. It's good enough for you to know that. So the rib is this part. This is the rib, which is a continuation of the top piece of loin. This top piece goes all the way there. There's no more filet mignon there. That's why it's a nice, beautiful standing rib roast for New, for New Year's or Christmas. And you roast it. It is so good. Also very, very tender, most expensive roast beef there is. Because you don't want to make roast beef out of here. <laughs> Too expensive. You want to use it for steaks. This you can use it for roast beef. Okay. If you do roast, if you, use it for roast beef, you, it actually goes from the sixth rib, this, the rib bone goes from six to 12 bone. So if you get a piece of rib steak, rib beef, th that's right here, it's almost like porterhouse. One time I went to the butcher's store, I said, well, can you give me, I'm only, a, can you give me a piece of, uh, standing rib rolls, but I don't need the entire rib rolls, which is pretty big. You have to serve a lot of people. Can you give me this end? He said, what do you mean? I said, around the 12 rib end. And so the butcher smiled. Oh, you want that end. Why did I want that end? Why did I want the 12th rib rather than the sixth bone? Six because of the, so close to the short loin, I'm getting almost, I could practically cut it up and grill it a steak if I want to. But because we have, but if you were to use it as roast beef, it's wonderful. It's just as tender as any T-bone steak for that part. So if you go to the butcher, ask them which part you want. Because if you get a piece of here, right next to the shoulder, it's almost a chuck, right? You don't <coughs> want that. <coughs> so you don't want the sixth 
rib bone. Six, it starts from the sixth bone to the twelfth bone. Okay, so now this is sirloin, still very good at steak. But take a look at the tenderloin. It gets larger, but it gets tougher because the animal moves more at this part. So it's not nearly as tender as here. So sometimes they give you a filet mignon that's so huge, the large end. I said, oh, is that still filet mignon? They said, oh, yeah, it's filet mignon. They probably have pulled it out of here. You got it? They charge you the same. Really, the smaller end is absolutely wonderful with filet mignon. You could practically just taste it and allow it to melt in your mouth. Uh, so it depends on which part. So this is sirloin, and you, they can make it into sirloin steak with both. But often they don't. Often they save this to be tagged onto the tenderloin here, and they sell just that sirloin steak. And you could recognize the sirloin steak because they have funny bones. You see the top? You see, still see a little bit at the top? Pin bone and then flat bone and then wedge bone. These are all funny bones. But the top looks almost like T-bone, doesn't it? So you know that, that piece is right next to here. So you would want that, but of course it has a, it has a piece of, you can broil that, I've done that. When I was younger, I don't eat beef very much anymore. My husband and I, if I knew what I was buying, we could have a very good piece of steak right there on top. Okay, but otherwise you could still broil them. Dry heat, still good. You don't need liquid to hydrolyze the collagen. There's very little collagen. And at the back, of course, you could have the whole roast beef if you want. The top, the top part, but slow heat. Long cooking, slow heat, low temperature. You can get it to tenderize. And then they, at the buffet table, they slice it. They know how to slice the chef's nose. Has to be very thin against the grain. Otherwise, it's too tough for you to chew. Okay? So, here, round top, round. You know, you, sometimes they have a top, a top round and a round steak, but, but sometimes they're a little bit tough. So, often we would use the braising method. That means you brown and then you introduce some liquid or juice to it and, uh, and it's still very good, tastes very good. But then if you, mm, it's very good meat, it's very tasty, not much fat, which is perfectly okay. It depends on whether you're serving your special guests or not. Okay, however, any of this part will be used as ground beef, okay? So they can use it as steak or you know, the rump rolls would all be here, but it's not going to be as tender, that's all. All right, so we already talked about here, four shank in the shank area. This is, of course, has to use moist heat cooking. Cook it for three hours. Oh, it's very gelatinous. It's wonderful, actually, after you cook it. Okay. <clears throat> or you could cut it up at steak, I mean stew, stew meat, small cubes for stew meat. This brisket corned beef, we already talked about that. This is short plate. Short plate here, you could use it, as, as I mentioned, short ribs. So look how fatty it is because the animal doesn't move very much, so it's still fatty. You could cook it short ribs, and when it softens, it's very gelatinous, very expensive dish also. Uh, or you could use it for beef stew, and sometimes skirt steak comes from here. Sometimes ground beef, of course, skirt steak could come from here or it's kind of tough, you have to, you really can't uh, grill like uh, you, you do for, uh, for steak. And flank, flank steak is okay if you slice it very thinly like the Asians do, you cut against the grain, must be, otherwise it's too tough. Otherwise, you make it into ground beef or flank, uh, you know, flank steak, you, you have to tenderize it. Slice it very thin slices or you add, um, We'll talk about that tenderizer to it, to tenderize it. Okay, um, over here, of, of course, the bottom part, uh, the roast, the tip, they're not very good unless if you use moist heat cooking to gelatinize the collagen, okay? So, have you got any questions here? And then because because it's important, I emphasize it again, which piece of primal cut 
will give you what kind of uh, fabricated um, cut and the dish name. Filet, short loin, of course, gives you filet mignon, gives you the T-bone. The T-bone would be like this. Filet mignon would be only the beef here. Short loin. I'm sure I'm going to test you on this. It will be on the exam. Because it's so expensive. Where is it coming from? It has to come from the short loin. Okay. Rib. It's easy. Prime rib of beef is coming from the rib cut. That's easy. Sirloin steaks. It's easy. It's coming from sirloin. Not, not a tender short loin, but it's okay. Meatloaf could come from chuck because it's tough. Meatloaf is ground meat. And sometimes the leftover short plate and all that. Okay. And roast beef on the cafeteria line. They call it roast beef. If they cook it, and if they know how to roast it, low heat, long time, still good, round, you can still eat it. The short place, sometimes the fajita. Yeah? Uh, Can you ask about the um, um, Well, ba basically, I might ask you th either this, it's almost the same tenderloin, short loin would. Would, would give you the tenderloin. I, I'm coming to that. I think it, it makes sense. Uh, let me see. Uh, short loin, I, I'll go back to it. I mentioned the filet mignon coming from here, of course. Sometimes you call it tenderloin steak. It's the same as filet mignon. Okay. T-bone steak will be coming from short loin. Okay. And rib will be the rib roast. That will be the old prime rib of beef, whichever way I ask you. And sirloin will be sirloin. Okay. Ground beef will come from any of the chuck, any of the extraneous, the other cuts, basically. Round, you can make a good piece of roast, large piece of roast beef. I might ask you this because you cannot go wrong with that answer. And, uh, and I probably won't ask you. Shank, I might ask you. You have to use it for beef stew. It has to be um, moisty cooking. Cook it for a long time, three hours or so. The short plate, Sometimes you can make really nice short ribs, which is very nice and gelatinous. You practically see the gelatin after you cook it. Do a good job with cooking a long time. So beef stew, of course, any of these would be beef stew. And the braised short ribs, again, I'm repeating this, pretty much a lot of this repetition. But anything too fancy, I probably won't ask you for heat up because I will ask you something more generic. My prime rib of beef is coming from rib roast. Meatloaf, you know, ground meat will be coming from chuck. Okay, okay. Braised short rib will come from probably the other. The, the answers are usually pretty straightforward that there will be no confusion. But I would want you to know uh, filet mignon coming from here, okay, short loin, and T-bone steak coming from short loin, and prime rib of beef coming from rib, yes, sirloin. So it's, it's pretty much standard as long as you know the, uh, uh, the approximate location of the beef, you, then you know, of the carcass, rather, then you know what method you should use, right, to cook it. Are there any questions? Before you take the final exam, I will go over these. Uh, I will tell you what you need to know. How's that? Just like last time. But I will, you remind me, I will make time for it. Pork, I'm not going to talk about it, because it's basically the same, just a smaller animal. These wholesale cuts are just larger, that's all. And as long as you know beef, it's the same as pork, any other carcass, right? So I won't talk about it. But I do want to talk about the aging process because that's what you run into, and you do need to use that so you understand it. After the, uh, the animal is um, slaughtered, the animal goes through rigor mortis uh, uh, stage, which takes about 6 to 24 hours. Basically, the muscles get very, very stiff. The animals, they call it green meat sometimes. It's, it, no matter what you do with it, it is so tough, you cannot cook it to soften. So during that particular stage, there's nothing we could do because the meat just stiffens. Okay. So you have to wait until rigor mortis is dissipated, has gone over that. So it takes about 72 hours or under refrigerated condition. Then the meat starts to soften a little bit. So now you can age it a little bit to make it even more, more tender because it's still, it's still maybe a little hard to eat. So we age it. When we age it, they could decompose the meat a little bit 
So what it is is that the natural enzymes will work on the meat, the natural microbes will be working on the meat to break it down a little bit. So break the meat down to soften it, to tenderize it. So not only is the flavor better, of course, there's more tenderness, and the taste also is a little softened and much better. So we have to allow the meat to go through the aging process, which is very important. Otherwise, you can't eat it. You call it, they call it green meat. And when you extend the aging process, actually, the meat becomes more tender and more flavorful. However, you don't want the meat to go bad, so we have to control. If you have the appropriate control with temperature and environment, we could do it. So let's take a look how we could do it. Okay, we could age it. Age it, remember, just allow it to stand at refrigeration temperature so it does not So, um, so we have to allow the meat. Just want to make sure everything's going okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so allow the meat to stand at refrigeration temperature a little longer to increase the tenderness and flavor before we uh, um, it, it even bring it to <coughs> the butcher. So pork, beef could be done, lamb could be done, but pork can never be done. Why not? Yeah? Are you saying this is for the butcher to well, do, not well, for us to do? No. Oh, no. We, we never do it. Oh, we don't even this see is, this. Okay, yeah. This is something that's before it even gets, before it even gets to the butcher. They, they do that. Okay. In the slaughterhouse, actually. Okay. Or sometimes the, uh, yeah, before they even get, yeah. Very few butchers around now. A lot of it coming up, we buy them already pre, um, um, it's already it's coming up, you, you'll see. We, we buy them in packages already tenderized, okay. So pork, we normally don't do it, but we could do it to beef and lamb. We allow it to stand at refrigeration temperature for a while to soften or to tenderize it. Veal is not available, not suitable, because there is, veal is young cow, right? young animal, so there's not enough fat, there's no protection. So when there's no protection, there's a lot of moisture loss. So it's not stable, you know, we, we don't get the benefit out of veal, so we never do it to veal, we never do it to pork, we only do it to lamb uh, sometimes, and mostly beef, to allow it to stand for a while in the slaughterhouse. Okay, now we talked about, okay, maybe, oh. Now, we talked about uh, meat tenderizers earlier. Um, so sometimes, uh, um, I think I'll probably get some meat tenderizer for the lab. Uh, if a piece of meat is tough, such as the round or chuck, you could actually prick the meat a little bit on the surface and sprinkle some meat tenderizer. Have you tried it? Somebody say no? Some, uh, actually, have anybody tried that? You could tenderize it, or you could actually do a little pounding to break up the collagen. You could do that and tenderize it. Okay. Uh, but you could use the tender, what is tenderizer? Do you know where it came from? You know, how do we make tenderizer? Actually, it's the enzyme from, papain is the enzyme from papaya, and bromelain is the enzyme from pineapple. Did you know pineapple has very powerful enzymes? If you put, put pineapple in gelatin dessert, the gelatin will never gel because the bromelain is there. So they've got pineapple, when you bite into it, you can feel it, you know, the enzyme. And same thing with papaya, very strong enzymes. And that's why Southeast Asian cuisine loves to have papaya cut up with meat. Why? They use tough pieces of meat, and they cook it with papaya just briefly, and it tenderizes the meat, and it's flavorful. No, nothing wrong with it. Okay, so they're taking advantage of the papaya that way, and pineapples too. Southeast Asians, especially from you know, they grow a lot of pineapples, so they use pineapples 
to tenderize the meat. Pineapple and meat, sweet and sour sauce, is wonderful. And the meat is tenderized. Okay. But here in the United States, if you know they're not as available, you could sprinkle these tenderizer on the meat, like what I said. And then, and then you, but the thing is, it's not the same when you taste it. It looks, to me, it tastes a little bit more powdery. Now, I didn't mind the papaya and the pineapples being cooked with meat because some, somehow it tastes more natural. You've got other flavors. But if you just, it, but to taste it, maybe you might not mind it, but it's tenderizer. And what's the tenderizer from? Papain and Brahman. That's what it is. Okay? Just so you know what it is. So you could take advantage of the lean cuts. You don't have to get all the fat and the marbling. And it tastes okay. If it tastes okay, you're going to have to put some, some fruit, some, something on it to make it taste good. <coughs> Let me see. I don't know whether I could finish this. Wet aging. Have you ever seen this? Basically storing the meat in a vacuum pack, plastic polyethylene bag. You've seen it. And they do that with the individual steaks. Charge you a lot. Very expensive. Okay. What is it? That's a wet aging. Basically, you have to refrigerate it. You can refrigerate it up to six weeks and still good because it's vacuum packed. And basically, just allow the natural enzymes and the microorganisms to break down the connective tissue a little bit more in, in a package. Okay, so they do that for expensive cuts. Another thing very much that I like, actually, is that it's individual packages. If you need, especially hospitals, institutions, and restaurants, you just take one piece out and then open up the package and serve. The rest could still, you know what I'm saying? So. So you could buy this, the, it's what they call the wet aging by natural enzymes. But it's a lot more expensive if you could afford to buy, okay? Because that process would increase the tenderness and flavor, uh, become more flavorful. Okay, so, it, oh yeah, common method for pre-portion. For pre-portion cuts, especially, especially filet mignon, you don't want to waste it. It's only when the guest orders it, then you, you, you serve it. Very expensive. This is something that you should know because when you go to the restaurant, they advertise it. Sometimes they could do dry aging and they advertise. Not too many restaurants do that anymore. I haven't been to that. I asked, which I like to try their meat. What it is, is that they do their, they hang up, they hang up their fresh meats they only do it to, to the best cuts, okay? Which cuts? Will be the rib, prime rib of beef, that's dry aged, or the steak, the loin, okay, filet mignon, New York steak loin cuts. So what it is is that they hang up these fresh meats in an environment that's controlled. Okay, the controlled environment means the temperature has to be correct, the humidity and airflow had to be correct, and they could do that for they do that for up to six weeks to tenderize it. You think that it's a little dangerous, but actually, the outside of the meat, when I took a look at it, we did visit this, you know, at the outside it was red before it became all dark, it's all dark brown or almost black, but you have to trim it off, and then the rest inside is so good, real flavor, you just can't, you have to taste it to believe it. And that's why they charge so much, they advertise it as dry aged steaks or dry aged roasts. So it's a natural decomposition process, the natural enzymes and the natural bacteria, good bacteria, microorganisms break down the connective tissue. And also they have a fan when you go into the room. It's, it's like a walk-in refrigerator. You go in, the temperature's not cold. It's controlled environment. Uh, they keep it at the temperature, but they have a controlled environment that's antibacterial. So they have this fan going, and this fan introduces the antibacterial, uh, like the vapors or whatever, to prevent the meat from going bad. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's not that cold to me when I walked in, but it, it's, but
but otherwise you could just hang it in, in the regular, you know. But this is why it, it's aged. It tastes aged. It tastes like it's old meat, and yet the flavor is so strong, it's so good. And people would walk, drive for miles to get this, as I said. They said that they don't even know of, I asked whether there's any restaurant that serves this. They said there is one. They advertise it. You have to drive farther away from, from the city. <coughs> so I never tried it. If you've tried it, you know, you ought to try it. But it, they could only afford to do it to the expense of tax. It's, a, it's a very clean environment. No bacteria there. That's what it is. This fan keeps blowing antibacterial uh, vapor, whatever it is. And that's why they could get it aged. Otherwise, the refrigerated environment would not be aged. And these are some of the sauces. And it's basically, we talked about the sauces before. The, the word au jus is just in juice. In French, it's in juice. So for prime river beef, it's best just to serve it with a little bit of the dripping juice that comes off of it. Okay. Bernays is a thick sauce. I don't quite like it, but it's thick because it has egg yolk and white, but it's very exquisite sauce if you like it. Okay. Tarragon vinegar and herbs, pretty strong in flavor. But typically you find brown sauce, which is very popular. Brown sauce is what we call sauce espanol. It's basically flavored beef sauce. So you've got the dripping from the beef and you have some fat there. You could use the beef fat for the roux or you could add fat but using the beef there. But of course any gravy is very rich, very high in calories. You add a little bit of the natural beef juice to it. It can be so good. So we talked about that. How do we make brown sauce, right? How do we make turkey gravy and beef gravy, right? So the brown sauce is the basis. So when you, later on when we talk about turkey next time, oh, coming up soon, okay, it's the same. You get a little bit of the dripping, which is the turkey dripping. You have to have the fat in order to introduce the flour. You put some all-purpose flour there, and you use a wire whip to make sure that you stir around it, that you don't get lumps. Okay. After you mix that, so you don't need butter because you already have the, what I do is that next week when I do the turkeys, I always, I always throw away some of the, some of the fat. You don't need all that fat. Okay. And I feel better. I use some dripping that's very flavorful and there's juice in it, in with the, so a little bit of the turkey fat. And I put, put the flour in, use a wire whip on top of the stove at medium heat and I whip it. Remember I used to get my daughter to do it. For, uh, for the turkey, and and then you add, um, you know, you have the turkey bone uh, neck, or whatever ways chicken, wo uh, turkey legs, whatever extra turkey pieces you have, you make your own uh, stock, and you can shrink it down. Throughout the day, I have a boil, not boiling, but simmering, okay, and you put some vegetables, very flavorful, and you put it in there, you make the best turkey gravy. <coughs> It's the same thing with beef. <coughs> you have to have some flavor, okay. From, so whatever beef dripping you have is the best, okay. And, and then they sometimes call, they serve, oh, they, they serve such good Madeira uh, sauce. What is Madeira sauce? It's brown sauce, add Madeira wine to it. Merlot sauce is brown sauce, add Merlot to it. And you serve the dinner with, with Merlot or Madeira wine to be more complimental, complimentary to each other. You know, the, the serve the wine with the sauce, with the same wine. It's, it's, it's probably the best match because it, one enhances the other. That's what they do in restaurants. Okay. And so you see a fancy name. What is a fancy name for the sauce, for the brown sauce? Basically, is it the name of the wine? Okay, so it's a wine sauce, and wine, after you cook it, alcohol evaporates, it's no longer wine. It doesn't taste like you, you're going to be drunk with alcohol. You don't have to worry about that. It's a flavor that's so good. Okay, 
uh, manir. Sometimes they serve with manir. It's basically brown butter with uh, uh, added. But some of the basics of brown sauce is all, it's all here. Okay. I just need to tell you the, the temp. You know, with beef, you can eat it rare. You can eat it medium rare without having to worry about it. I mentioned to you before, I don't know whether you remember that. If this is a piece of roast beef, when you roast it in the oven, this is going to get cooked and brown. The inside is still good. Nobody touched it. Still sterile. Nobody, because it's been inspected, healthy, animal, you don't have to worry about it. We could eat it rare, no problem. Okay, so I just gave you the temperature, what this should be the temperature, what does it say? Okay, you at 140, you'd be somewhat pink, yeah? Yeah, the stamp would be the uh, the round stamp, so inspection okay. stamp. That means that the carcass, that the animal was healthy before slaughter. I just can't wrap my head around every single piece of meat being stamped. Oh no, you don't see that. You only see it in the. Uh, that's what I meant. When I, when I brought my class to the slaughterhouse, that's when we see it, so because the skin is going to be removed. Right, but still, does every single carcass look stamped? Oh yes. All the way down in purple, you can't even see because the car. You know they hanging, they hung so up there to the roof. Like, no, no, no. It, it, see what it is? It's, it rolls. You start from one row, coming all the, almost like a masking tape, it, it machine roll, all the way down. They, they just right next to each other. Oh yes, USDA. Oh, they have to stay there. And yeah. And then they stamp, safe to eat. United States beef is the safest. Okay. Oh, well, no, it has, well, a USDA, if it crosses the, the state line, with all meats, by the way, if it's within the state, you could eat it by yourself, nobody knows. But if you sell it or whatever it is, you know what I'm saying? It's just, anytime you cross the state line, it has to be inspected. Yeah, because it, when you raise your own animal, you eat it, give it to friends, nobody knows. So that big on, on a big slaughterhouse would be, oh, animals are coming from everywhere. Oh, that's funny. Oh, yeah. We're eating them for Oh, they all inspect it for sale. Absolutely so. They cannot, because like Safeway or whoever meat vendors, they, they must. Yeah, we don't have to worry about that. That's the test, the inspection stamp is the stamp for wholesomeness. Healthy. I'm glad you asked that question. Very important. That's why United States, the beef is the best, the safest to eat. Absolutely. Yeah. Grades are not important. Grades just identify whether that piece of meat has marbling or not, which you carry, you may not care. But the most important thing has to have that stamp at the slaughterhouse. They there. They cannot. The slaughterhouse cannot be in operation without the inspector at, on site. And we saw them in white lab coats. Yeah, they identified the inspector. Okay, I'm glad you, you mentioned it. So, so the, the middle there is still safe to eat, so that's what I'm trying to say here. Okay, so let me see. There. But, okay, I did say the, so it, even though it's 140, that's rare, you could still eat. It's in the middle. The outside is already seared, right? Cooked. They cut into the middle. They even could wheel that uh, meat cart all the way from table to table. It's pretty safe to eat. Well done. To me, if you have a good piece of meat, <laughs> you should eat either medium rare or at least medium. If you eat a well, <laughs> well done meat, uh, you waste it. Especially American beef is so good. It's no longer moist. It's no longer uh, juicy. But these are the, the guidelines, okay? And uh, lamb, it's the same, the same guideline for rare 140, medium 160. Pork, of course, has to be cooked, of course, pork 170 because we're afraid of what? 
trachine, which is the worm, okay, which we don't. Pork can never be eaten. I, I don't want to, I could tell you story after story, but uh, we don't have time. It has to be eaten. Well done. Oh, yeah, if you want, you, if you don't have a meat thermometer, by the way, the meat thermometer has to go into the middle of the meat. If you don't have a meat thermometer, you can, if you dangle your hand like that, and if you press here, you know how soft it is? Okay, so that's when it's what? Rare, just like rare meat. And when you stretch your hand out, and you press it like that, it's more firm. That's medium. And when you harden your hand like that, into a, a, a tight ball like that, and you press into it, it's really tight, very difficult, and that's well done. Okay, so if you want to do that, you, that's approximately, the best thing is use a meat thermometer, okay. which we always do, we should do. A dry heat, which ones are the dry heat cooking method? You ought to know. Roasting, we don't introduce any moisture at all. You ruined us. With dry heat, no moisture at all. Okay, there's enough taste, enough juiciness from the marbling itself anyway. Closed door. Broiling, heat is above and you broil the meat underneath. And you turn it over. When one side is done, you turn it over to the other side. No moisture. Open door. Because once you close, you introduce steam. Sometimes it gets steamed up inside. Grilling, grill on top of the grill. In open air, no moisture. Moist, I mean, dry heat. So frying is also, frying, there's no moisture. Just fry, also dry heat. So these are used only for tender cuts, dry heat, tender cuts. You don't need moisture to tenderize the collagen or connective tissue, okay? So don't spoil steak by using moist heat. You cook it for an hour, two hours, or three hours. You've ruined the meat. You cannot eat it, so, okay? Oh, let me see. Saute, pan fry, and deep fry are all suitable for tender, okay? pan fry, whatever, with a little bit of oil, whatever it is, but no moisture. Once you introduce moisture, moist heat for less tender cuts of older animals, braising. Braising means brown and add some juice to it, beef broth or chicken broth, beef broth, simmering or water. Uh, and you can add carrots, celery, you know, pot roast. Okay, not microwave. Microwave ovens are not the best option because you don't have the even heating process. Use regular oven for braising, that means browning, and introducing some liquid in the oven is fine. Simmering, stewing, also, uh, okay, moist heat. For less tender cuts, sometimes you have to cook it for hours to tenderize it. Okay, when you cut meat, make sure you cut across the grain. Cut against the grain. Because connective tissue, you remember those fiber, long fibers, you want to cut against it. So it's not so tough. And the Asians in, in cutting up the meat slices, are, they, they know exactly how to cut it. So by the time it's cooked, very tender. And they could use carving. Okay, our veal, veal comes from young calves. So young animals, only six to seven months. So basically, the meat is pretty young, and uh, by the time they reach one year, it's called a cow, okay? So it, uh, you veal, I've seen it, uh, it doesn't have much marbling because it's too young to have marbling. So uh, it's already, okay, I'm sorry, I, I should finish the, with the veal. Okay, veal, you could, you could, uh, generally speaking, it's quite good if you pan fry and brown and introduce, it's okay to use moist heat cooking, but it's kind of like in between. Uh, so, um, because it is young, it doesn't have fat at all, 
So you have to be careful. Otherwise, it gets dried out very easily is what it is. Um, storage of needs. Needs should be stored. Everybody should know. Proper storage. Uh, the best thing is you have a freezer box for freezing needs, frozen needs, and a regular refrigerator, a walk-in refrigerator, for keeping the meats at the right temperature, right above freezing. You don't want it to freeze if it's not a freezer. So between 30 to 36 is about right to keep it for a little longer than, than just regular produce boxes, different produce boxes, always a little higher in temperature. Okay, and generally speaking, uh, it's expensive to buy meat, so you cannot keep meat for a long time. So if you keep it in the refrigerator, an original wrap, only one or two days you should eat it up within a day or two. Otherwise, for storage beyond two days, you should wrap it really tight, label and date. And that's the way they recommend that you wrap on the top, fold it, and then uh, fold under, and then tape so that you could keep it for longer. Otherwise, meat cannot. Oh, this is it. Okay. So that's all that we have on meat. And then I have poultry and fish, which are much shorter classes. Small. Let me see. I thought I had it stored. Let me see. Uh, poultry is next. Poultry here. Okay. Well, now that we've covered meats, which is the most uh, difficult topic of all meats. So this should be pretty easy and quick. Um, it's perfectly good protein for us to eat poultry, less expensive, and actually more protein and less fat. So, uh, but if you take a look at the classifications of chicken, it doesn't take long for them to raise chicken to be slaughtered, less than 10 weeks. Can you imagine for fryers and broilers? That's what you see now. Within 10 weeks, they're already on the market for you to, to buy. So they're still nice and tender. Roasters, we used to be able to buy roasters, larger chickens, less than 12 weeks, but we no longer, they don't, the faster they sell, the more profit they could make. And then they don't sell the roasters as well as they do with the broilers. So um, that not very often do we see roasters, but stewing chicken, Oh, many, many years ago, we used to see stewing chicken. Stewing chicken, very old chicken is what it is, 10 months. they flavorful. It's perfectly good for making chicken stock, chicken soup, but not good for eating. Turkeys, the young turkeys are less than six months. <coughs> young toms, toms, tom, <coughs> represent male, male turkeys. Young hens, hens are female. Generally speaking, less than six months you have, you have them on the market for us to buy. And as far as pigments and composition, very similar to meat, but they have less connective tissue. So generally speaking for poultry, we use only dry heat cooking method. You don't need to introduce uh, you don't have, need to cook them for an hour, two hours, or even three hours. Not, no way. Not even an hour. And especially now, all you find are the broil broilers or fryers. Very young chicken anyway. So just use dry heat is all we need. The pigments have, you know, they have white and dark meat. I'm going to quickly cover. We don't really need to go over this very self-explanatory. And sometimes the dark meat, sometimes white meat. Some people like dark meat. Sometimes people like... Uh, light meat. It's the amount of myoglobin. It's the color of the pigment, of the muscle. <coughs> and it's a, it has a little more fat 
than the, the, the white meat. And for poultry, it's the same. When they cross the state line, okay, poultry is inspected for wholesomeness before and after slaughter by USDA, United States Department of Agriculture inspector. And once they have it inspected, they do the same. Round stamp, okay, that means um, they've been inspected. And it's pretty impressive because they cannot start slaughtering them until the inspector is there. They check them to make sure that the chickens, most important of all, are healthy before, are wholesome to eat before they slaughter them, okay. And uh, also they inspect the plant to make sure that the place is clean, sanitary condition, everything, you know, soap and water and uh, sanitizing agent to clean the, the plant and equipment and all that. Okay. So two things I forgot to mention, not only do they inspect the carcass, they, they inspect the plant also, the cleanliness of the plant. And the same for, look, for, uh, for poultry, uh, they also have grading. Grading is what is the shape of the grades? The shield, you have to know that. When you see the shield, you know it's voluntary. That means they don't have to have it graded. But sometimes they want it graded because they could sell better. Consumers might ask for that and they think that they could demand a better price also. So it's a shield. Basically, there are three grades, A, B, and C. You don't even see C. They sell without C. Why put the C on? You know what I'm saying? Just like getting a C grade. Well, I might as well put an A or B grade. And so A or B is what you're gonna be seeing, and that's, um, that's when you know. It's USDA. Uh, what is it again? The shield grade is what? is voluntary and what? It represents what? Represents, actually it's easier, I think it's coming up. See, one is A, one is B. More fleshy, looks more uniform on the A, the other one a little skinnier and not as uniform. Not basically by, basically by the look. How, how about nutritional value? Any difference? No, not really. So as long as, if it's inspected here, inspected here, and it's cheaper by a lot of money, why not? This is just as good if somebody wants to save some money, right? No difference in nutritional value. The most important thing is that they have to be inspected and USDA makes sure that they are inspected. Um, also, most importantly, of course, they're not stored for a long time. They're freshly sold, you know, sometimes they keep them for too long and they already not good quality, how freshly, um, how, how fresh they are basically at the time when you buy. So the rest is pretty sam uh, explanatory. The flesh is meaty and all that, uniform fat, okay, well formed, good, clean appearance. So this is most often seen at the retail. B, people don't like to see B, A is better. So they sell, otherwise they might not even use USDA B grade, why? This again for the same reason we all are concerned about as consumers. Uh, we, we always complain, a lot of consumers write notes and, uh, and uh, complain. Organic chicken, it's just that they're very expensive when you buy anything that's organic unfortunately. But they're good, no antibiotics. Why do we need more antibiotics? No hormones needed and no pesticides used in the soil or feed. Yeah. And organic chickens, generally speaking, because they roam around, they walk around, they're leaner, more protein and less fat. Whereas, you know, can you imagine regular fryers that you buy? They're so fatty, there's so much fat when you cut it up, you have to remove more fat not enough protein, and why do we need more fat, right? The free range, you, you could buy free range chicken. Okay. <clears throat> Those are the chickens that are not raised in cramped quarters in cages. And it, as I said, it's pathetic to see them, how, how they could put them in those tight cages. They get to roam around. And a lot of people are firm believers uh, that uh, 
the animals should not be, should not suffocate like the way they do. And no stress. They think that if they're not stressful, uh, they don't get diseased. It's better that we, we eat them that way and they'll promote them. It's just that they're more expensive, unfortunately. Now, this is something that you ought to know. All po poultry should be washed inside and out and patted dry with paper towels, not with cloth towels. Why? Use paper towels because you throw it away. Because it, it, it contains what? Yeah, microorganisms such as salmonella. So we have to be very careful when we handle raw poultry. Dish towels should not be used, yeah. Why? I, I wash all fruits, I tell my daughters, all fruits and all vegetables because they use all the fertilizer. I don't know what they use. And, um, and especially when they, chickens might have salmonella, the cleaner they are, I always wash them. Now fish, if it's very fresh fish, it's different, nicely filleted, might be okay, but especially poultry because of salmonella. Okay, uh, so not to use dish towels because the dish towels could be the inhab inhabitant for, uh, for microorganisms, that's all. Yeah, ma'am. Um, my microbiology What did he say? Uh, he said that she. Your recommendation is not to wash the towels. Oh. Because, because you, the towels may be dirtier. Well, you just get all that in the sink. Oh, get all that in the sink? Well, we assume that uh, I'm saying as we're almost like professionals, we know better. Why do we have to wash? Why do I want to wash the chicken? If I wash the chicken, well, I know better than that, that the sink is full of salmonella. Oh, I always clean. I sometimes complain about my husband. Oh, oh, when he's gone, I would scrub and I would clean it so well. But if we don't know what we're doing, then of course, maybe does not make any difference. That's the way I feel, Max. Okay, so that will be my comment of it. I'd rather wash and I'd rather clean and that's why paper towel and throw away the towels or, and, or to wash. Dish towels should not be, oh yeah, because yeah, we already said that. Did I answer your question? Um, this is important, okay. Uh, if when we thaw chicken, because they have salmonella, we assume they have salmonella, refrigerator is the best place to thaw frozen bird. Don't thaw it at room temperature, because once it's at room temperature, once it's, sometimes we forget, we walk around, they're already thawed, and then the salmonella would multiply, multiply, multiply at room temperature. So thaw at refrigeration temperature. And, but put it, where in the refrigerator should you put it? Very important. Which rack? There are many racks. When you thaw meat, frozen meat or frozen poultry, where should we put it? At the bottom. Because of, because of what? Dripping. And if you drip onto fresh produce, it's at the bottom. Wow. And if you don't take caution with washing the you see, fresh produce we use as salad and all that we don't cook, then we're in trouble. Okay. So, but so sometimes the chicken takes a long time to defrost. It takes about a, a day. So at nighttime, you could just take it out of the freezer and put it in the refrigerator. Make sure you have, put it on a tray that could catch the liquid from uh, defrost. Sometimes it takes longer. A turkey takes one to five days, depending on how big it is. So we have to always allow space in the refrigerator to defrost turkey if you buy frozen turkey. Okay, for <coughs> okay, after thawing, it could be baked, the chicken or the turkey. We never, never stuff, it's not allowed actually in hospital institutions, they no longer stuff turkey. Why? No stuffing when we bake, when we roast it, the turkey. Why? Because, first of all, whether it's chicken or turkey, they get, the meat gets dried out very easily. We want to cook it until just done. 
we take it out. And if you have to heat it all the way until the stuffing reaches 165, then by then, the meat outside is already dried out. Or the meat outside is nice and tender, the inside is still raw. So never stuff. We tell even restaurants, no more. They always, the stuffing is, is not as tasty. It doesn't have the dripping, but we don't need the fat anyway. Always in a separate pan, to bake a separate pan, okay? And we use a meat thermometer for turkey. Why? Because we don't know. It's so important that we reach the top proper temperature, 160. In reality, 160 would destroy all of salmonella. You have to know that 160. But to be safe, they said 165. But I know what I'm doing usually, so I, uh, I do my best. Okay. I, I, <coughs> I don't want to brag about myself, but when I invite people to my Thanksgiving dinner, they always tell me, I never liked turkey before. But now I know turkey could be juicy and tender at the end. Depends on how you, how you roast it. If you prepare turkey properly, the poultry should be tender and juicy. When you cut into the turkey, the meat should still be moist. You can see the juice coming out of it. That means it's nice and tender and moist, not dry. I'll tell you how to do it. Overcooking high temperature, high temperature will cause the poultry to be always tough and stringy and dry and nobody wants to eat it. And that's why a lot of people say, oh, I never like turkey. It is so dry. No, it doesn't have to be dry. Okay. And institutions now know how to cook it. Basically, long cooking, low temperature, but still reaching that temperature. I'll tell you about it in just a little while. So, <clears throat> but sometimes the fat that melts off of it, w when I make my turkey, I don't have that much fat dripping, if you use that method. Otherwise, the fat that gets off of the, could be used, of course, to make sauce and all, to make uh, gravy. So, I already mentioned that after you roasted the turkey, the dripping that's in the pan will be used as fat instead of adding additional fat. Don't add additional butter, you've got the fat there. I always drain off some fat because we don't need all of that. I rather make a rule that's lighter and if you don't have enough of your, or if you're not making the stock, just add a can of chicken broth. Okay, you could all, I add a can of chicken broth for additional flavor even though I have already the juice from the pan. <coughs> or uh, the stock that I'm making. I, because I don't waste the neck or whatever it is. I always make some stock. It has a whole day to cook at low heat. Let's see. Let me see. Okay. Did I tell you how I... Eventually, there's one slide. I think i tell you how to, how to do it. Okay. Um, it, it, this is the cook until well done because of the risk. Everybody knows this. Okay. Uh, you have to use a thermometer. Okay. What I do... Okay. The thermo let me finish reading this. Okay, the internal temperature, it says here 165 to be safe. However, you know, I know at 160, it's already pretty safe. But I have to make sure it's 160 everywhere, okay? But I know when I take it out, it is still very juicy. It has to be, ju almost, you can almost see the juice okay, coming out of the turkey. And it's so nice, flavorful, and juicy. And the thermometer has to be placed right in the middle of the meat for you to detect the temperature. Of course, 165 is a standard. As I said, I could play around with it. Let me see, did it say, do I have a, okay, no. What it is, what I do is that I roast turkey at low temperature, okay? Even if you roast it at 200, eventually the inside of the meat is gonna to come to 160, am I right? It just takes a long time. I put it in early, in the, not early, sometime in the morning. I get my husband a big turkey if I had a large group. But this is my trick of doing it, is, and that's what institutions do. Okay. They have those big roasters, and they could actually adjust the temperature very well. They could cook it actually overnight. Then they would only do it at two, 200, and then when it 
takes to a certain temperature, it would automatically stop, you know, for institutions. So that's why their turkey often is professionally done nice and moist. You cannot eat any, you cannot serve any turkey that's dry and overcooked. But I kind of play around with it because the problem is that with institution, they don't have to have the surface of the turkey brown. I hate to take a turkey out, cook it at low temperature, it's not even brown. They say, oh, my daughter said, Mom, are you sure it's cooked? I don't know. Because you don't know. It looks like it's raw almost. So what I do is I brown it a little bit at the beginning. Okay, at about 300, brown it a little bit, take it off right away. I, then I drop the temperature to close to, actually, depending on how long a day I have, I could do it at 225 or something. I kind of play with the temperature and play it with the uh, thermometer. And I, when I reach about 160, turn everything off, the temperature is going to continue to go up a little bit. And even at 162, when you take it out, it should be nice and moist. There shouldn't be any problem. The only thing is that I don't have a lot of juice, so that's why I have to add and make my own stock because there's very little juice that you, you, you're losing. Okay, so whatever temperature you use, okay, I don't dare tell pe a lot of people, the amateurs would really, because at 200, they think that they could roast it for three or four hours, it's ready, five hours, no, it's not ready. So you really have to leave it in there practically for the whole day, or majority from uh, usually like nine or 10 o'clock until we're ready to eat at six o'clock. But I constantly play with the temperature because I thought, I, I know what I'm doing, and I want it to be nice and moist. Sometimes they do brining. Brining is basically put, did you, did you know what brining is? The turkey is salty somewhat, but it's nice and moist. You wonder what, on, but the only thing is that sometimes it's very salty, which is not good either. They brine it often. Sometimes they inject salt in it, and they add water to it. So what it is, uh, you could do the same thing. You put a turkey in a big tub of water, you put salt, sugar, water outside, so the salt goes in along with it. By diffusion, and by osmosis, the water goes in too. So it's nice and moist no matter what you do. And now you take it out, you roast it, it is very nice and moist. Most important thing is that poultry has to be moist before it's good. And it is good. The only thing is very cumbersome. You've got to have a big tub. And of course you put, you know, it's an extra step. And sometimes you put it, put too much salt, it's too salty. It's artificially too, too salty, which is not good either. So I have the recipe here in case somebody wanted to try it. But that's what brining is. Sometimes they sell it as such. And sometimes they brine it at home. And then, uh, so, let me see. I wonder. Preparation on turkey, anything here that I, it has to, yeah, the juice of a kukuru. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, when you touch it, the well done the turkey should feel firm. Yeah, I've well, we already talked about that. So, when you wiggle the drumstick, it should move easily. But often it does not move that easily for mine because if you're cooking it and you're just done, you may not have these signs. Um, but the temperature is very important. It has to reach the proper temperature before you serve. Okay, for dry heat, would be roasting or baking. Basically, we don't introduce any moisture to it. Broiling or grilling. And I think the lab coming up after Thanksgiving, the, I think we would do, uh, uh, I already talked to Emil about that, um, steak, one piece of steak with marbling so you can see it and a piece of, uh, some chicken and fish for you to see. So, uh, uh, and frying also. You remember we said that we don't use moist heat cooking? Generally speaking, we don't use moist heat cooking unless if it's stewed chicken, stewing chicken. That means it's very, very old chicken. Otherwise, we use dry heat or, or frying. Because it's already very tender. You know how many weeks? Less than 10 weeks, they sell them. Hardly, there's no collagen. Okay, so don't overcook chicken or t turkey, dry heat. Sometimes if they were to use, we don't use, unless if it's 
stewing. We don't stew chicken. It's broken to pieces. Poaching. Yeah, sometimes we do do poaching. Soak it in water, and then it could be cold. Cold um, poaching, you have to be careful also, unless it, if it's a, generally speaking, moisty cooking is just very difficult. You, it, it's going to be broken up into pieces. Uh, but every once in a while, if you do it right, it's still okay. In Europe, you see that often because their chicken, generally speaking, is older, so you can use moist seed. No microwaving. No. Now for turkey, small turkey or large chicken, roasting chicken, sometimes you want to roast chicken or smaller turkey, generally speaking, um, for 8 to 12 pounds at 325 is what they recommend, okay, on the label. Now, the larger is a bird, the lower could you go down in temperature. So you could lower the oven, tempe oven temperature to less than 300 or to 250 sometimes I pay, or even 225. I don't want to tell everybody that, but you have to control really well for larger birds. Lower temperature takes longer time depending on how long you have. You could even do it over and overnight at 200, 220. They've done it overnight. And you know that the internal temperature has to reach 165 or above 160, then you're safe. Okay, that means salmonella is killed. This is where the adjustment is made. Over time, how much time you have, how low can you go. But be very, very careful because it does have salmonella unless we, we know what we're doing. Sometimes the poultry is trussed, that means they bound together, they tie the legs and the wings together because they're so afraid that the white meat will be overcooked. So they tie them together so it's in one bundle, so it takes a little more time to get in. It's very important for them to protect the white meat. Okay, so this is why they do it. They just leave it in there when it's cooked, then you cut up the strings. <coughs> okay, that's how they tie. I'm gonna, storage of poultry the same must be, uh, Precaution, okay. I need to, okay, ready to cook. Can be only safely stored, kept in the refrigerator for up to three days. And unless if you want to, uh, why, okay, okay. <coughs> Anytime you have frozen poultry that you want to, birds that you want to defrost, make sure you put it at the bottom, okay. Even ready to, any kind of ready to cook poultry, Put it, don't, don't store it for too long because it goes bad very easily. Put it as a habit always at the bottom, the bottom shelf of the refrigerator because of dripping. The dripping that can contaminate, okay? Uh, for frozen poultry, it can be stored for, you know, uh, I'm a little worried because I can't get to the fish now. I don't know whether I can. Let's see. Uh, I think this is self-explanatory. I'm going to skip this. The questions, I've already done that. I've already gone over the questions, so I'm going to skip it. And I have, let me see, the, um, it's a very short class on, uh, on fish. I think in 15 minutes. Never enough time for me to tell stories. Okay, all right, fish. Basically, there are two kinds, fin fish and shellfish. Fin fish, any fish that has fins and internal skeleton, the bones inside. Shellfish, of course, everybody knows there are two kinds, crustaceans and mollusks. Crustaceans are the crabs, the lobsters, and the shrimp that ha has the outer shell. And, of course, uh, the mollusks are the clams, the oysters, that has two, the shells that are basically um, in folds, the two parts to the shell, they open up, okay, mollusks. Clams. Okay. And let me see. 
fish, there's very little collagen. So fish, basically, you don't cook it with moist heat at all because the muscles are shorter, okay, and there's hardly any connective tissue or none at all, okay. So basically, you cook it. The most important thing about fish is they cook and digest them only and serve as the best fish. Uh, and you don't have to worry about collagen. And this you need to know. Lean fish versus fatty fish. Okay. Lean fish is any fish that is white in color or creamish in color. There's basically no color. Okay. Fatty fish is any fish that has color. You could tell. Salmon is red. Mackerel is grayish black. Herring, tuna, grayish, anything, any fish that has color, it's fatty. Because we, for a while, everything was omega-3, omega-3 is good for you, omega-3 is good, it's good for you. That was a, <coughs> a while ago that fatty fish is good for you. And don't eat the, <coughs> the fat from the meat. <coughs> so if you were to choose, they said, well, eat salmon, salmon is good for you. And now we're concerned about salmon, about something else which, we'll be, which I'll be <coughs> talking to you about. So how can you determine that the fish is lean or fat? By the color. Anything, any fish that has color, red or grayish or blackish or whatever, has fat. Okay, and for a long time, people would choose fatty fish to eat because it has omega-3 that's good for your health because they have proven that. So all these, how can you tell? We already, I already answered the question, okay? Let me see. I don't even have my notes with me. That's okay. <laughs> I could teach without my notes. <laughs> so. So salt, salt water, ocean fish, salt water fish has, you could tell from the flavor what is fresh water. Can you tell what is fresh water, what is salt water? Salt water fish has a very distinct, stronger flavor if it's ocean fish than fresh water fish. Can you tell the difference, fresh water, lake fish? You cannot. Okay, um, to me, I could tell if a fish comes from a lake or artificial lake, okay, or farm-raised fish. It's the odor. You cannot tell? The mud. I could taste the mud almost right away. If it's from the ocean, it tastes different. It tastes like ocean water. Am I talking nonsense or no? Can you tell? Oh yeah, you can tell. Anybody else can tell. Farm-raised fish versus ocean fish. Can you tell? Next time when you, when you eat a piece of meat, try. Especially when you know, see these are the fish that's farm-raised. Take a look. Catfish. Oh, the odor is so strong. You know, that's the odor of dirt and water, dirty water or dirt in the water. I never want to eat catfish anymore because they only do farm raised now. Perch, sometimes trout. Now they're doing a lot of salmon. Before salmon was all ocean salmon. Now they do farm raised salmon, unfortunately, and pike. But of course, we have freshwater salmon too, such as halibut, cod, flounder. Mackerel, salmon, you could get the fresh water or the sea water. The flavor is very different. But the meat is how I, another way you could tell, one is the odor that I don't like. I don't like. What el how else can you tell if it's ocean fish versus farm raised? How about the flesh itself? Firm, yes, who said that? Yeah, nice. Yeah, much firmer. Sometimes people don't like it, especially children. This is hard. They like the farm raised because it's so soft. They call it 
Atlanta salmon, very soft, but it's so fatty. And you know it's farm raised. It's terrible that they are raising all the fish, most majority of the fish in the farm because the farm raised, the problem is that there are a lot of, what are some of the issues with farm raised fish? Let me see, is that the next slide? I don't have my notes with me. First of all, farm raised fish, generally speaking, are fattier, much, has much more fat because they don't move around just like the animals. They're restrained, they're confined into the water, they don't swim around. So anything that's fatty, okay, so yeah, they're, they're very soft. I could taste the mud actually, but some people cannot tell it. And some people now are allergic to it. Okay. I know a person that really gets sick. He is so sensitive to farm raised because it just doesn't agree with him. I said, you're lucky. <laughs> then you know you cannot eat farm-raised fish. See, what they have found is that the PCD polychlorinated biphenyls used to be used as a coolant in electrical equipment. It's toxic. It was banned a long, long time ago, 1978. And it was linked to cancer. And they found there is a high concentration of PCB actually in the oils and the fat of farmed fish because they always go to where the fat is, the fatty fish. And it could be as much as 16 times the, the rate of the wild fish. And people were very, very disturbed at it. But what do you do? We don't have enough fish. Fish is good for you, but we don't have enough fish for everybody, for the general population. Okay. So. There are other chemicals where they analyze it. A lot of other chemicals that are found in farm-raised fish. Unfortunately, this is the problem that we have. So whenever you see extra fat, don't eat it. Just trim it off. And I see people eating the skin. Don't eat the skin of any fish because it has more fat, and that's where a lot of chemicals are collected. Fat. Skin has fat. Okay. So try to eat the wild and firmer texture salmon or fish. Yeah. Is the skin of wild fish also bad? Well, not as bad, but it, to eat the skin of farmed uh, fish will be really bad. They usually like the skin. They eat skin of any fish. Not Sometimes we don't know whether it's wild or farmed, so we can't tell. But as a rule, just don't eat mercury, a anything else. Generally speaking, all the chemicals are collected on the skin. It's a, it's a good idea not to eat the, the skin of, of any animals, any way, steak and no fat, no extra fat, and no, at least it's a little better. Okay. And did you know that there is a high, almost all fish have some level of mercury? And it's really sad the fish has come to this stage. Such healthy food and we cannot enjoy very well. Um, so now, did you know preg pregnant women are not allowed? Oh, you knew that. Uh, are not, uh, uh, or breastfeeding mothers are not allowed to eat salmon, certain fish. They tell them what they're not allowed to eat. Mainly because of, because of, the, uh, of the mercury high levels of mercury are found in what type of fish? Do you know? Larger, in larger fish. Larger fish such as swordfish, shark, mackerel, the large tidal fish, the huge, you know. What it is is they found out that actually the large fish eat the small fish and all the chemicals are in the small fish and when they analyze it. And this is, the, they couldn't figure out why, okay. So there's a high level of mercury also in halibut, in large fish, tuna, no tuna. They're very cautious. The doctor said, no, this kind of fish, no, no, to tell anybody who's pregnant because they don't want mer mercury to be transferred onto the baby or breastfeeding mothers. Okay. 
Okay. Visual. Oh, we already talked about that. Did you know, unfortunately, did you know we don't even have good shrimp anymore? Did you know 80% of our shrimp, 80% of shrimp, did you know, take a look at the package. They have the label from Singapore, from Vietnam, from Thailand. Did you see that? The shrimp packages? So unfortunate. We no longer raise our own shrimp anymore. And you don't know where they got the, no way can we tell with, I don't even eat shrimp anymore. Oh, my friends love the large, oh, huge shrimp. Prawns, I don't even eat them anymore. My husband can't eat them anyway, so we just, as we, from Thai, yeah, China, Vietnam, uh, I listed them. That's where they're from. It's just pathetic, okay? And you don't know whether they were raised in unclean, polluted water because we didn't see them. We don't know what the water was like. And they're putting antibiotics. They're putting toxic, you know, chemical, chemicals are found in them because they eat all the other small fish that have chemicals that it really could cause serious health issues. So we don't know what we're eating in restaurants. It is pathetic. So we used to love to eat fish, and now we say, uh-uh, what are we eating? Is it better not to eat fish or to eat fish that we don't know the source? Okay. And I really, a lot of consumers have written letters to FDA. They need to get involved with testing fish and fish products. If it's not every batch, occasionally to test it. If they could test our water here, why can't they test the water coming from, or don't get them. All those prawns, big prawns, beautiful prawns, they shrimp, whatever you're eating at the restaurant, how would you know where they're coming from? 80% from other countries. Generally speaking, from India, from all Bang Bangladesh, wherever. How do, would you know what kind of water they raise in? So this is where I think, but the thing is, as a, the issue is so vast, it's such a big problem. How do they test them? But I, to me, anything is possible if they could even, even begin to do that. So they can do um, sometimes voluntary inspection and grading, by the way, can by processor, but nothing by, by FDA, okay? So any voluntary inspection is done by National Marine Fishery Service and the U.S. Department of Commerce, not USDA, U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, I'm going to have to skip that, you know. Uh, I just want you to know steaks are cut this way. Fish steaks are cut this way. Single fillet, fish fillets are just one side, single fillet on one side, okay? So when you buy fish, you know what you're buying. Uh, I have to skip around. Oh, you want to buy fresh, if it's good fish from good clean water, you want to make sure it's fresh. The fish is very, very good, very fresh, okay? If they smell fresh, you could smell the fresh aroma, fish aroma. They have to have tight scales just like they, they, they are alive. They, the flesh has to be firm, not flabby. And the gills have to be red, just like live fish, okay? And they should look alive. One time I went to the fish market. I said, is that fish fresh? When did you catch them? And I went to Half Moon Bay or something. And I saw a whole crate of fish, you know, that they just dropped on the floor. And the fish were just jumping. And one jumped on my leg. I said, oh, oh I want this one that jumped. <laughs> you know, well, you know, I thought you got scared. I said, no, I want this one because it is like live fish. You know, Asians are very good with eating fish because they know the fish is so good when it's cooked until steam or cooked until just done. When they, and w there's nothing like eating fresh fish, but it has to be almost like live fresh. And just like corn, Corn is so, fresh corn is so good, okay. While you are picking the fresh corn, you already have the water boiling. You put the corn on the cob in the water right away. It's the best corn. Same thing with fish. Okay. It has to be fresh before it's good. Shrimp, did you know how to buy shrimp? Okay. 
it is by number per pound. The larger is the number per pound, the smaller is the fish. The smaller numbers, only 10 uh, shrimp per pound, then it's larger. It's by size, it's number per pound.